This is Macro Analytics, delivering frank conversations on global macroeconomics and market analysis outside the mainstream, featuring discussions and debates between Gordon T. Long, publisher and editor of GordonTLong.com and his guests. The content of this discussion is strictly the opinion of the participants. It is in no way a solicitation for business, nor is it to be considered investment advice of any sort. Always consult a registered investment advisor before making any investment decision. These discussions are extremely hard-hitting and terribly frank, and parental discretion is advised. Now, on to the show. Good morning. I'm Gord Long with GordonTLong.com. As part of our ongoing series on financial repression, I have Martin Armstrong joining us here this morning. Martin is editor and publisher of Armstrong Economics. Welcome, Martin. Oh, thank you for inviting me. I appreciate you taking the time. There are so many people exploring this world of financial repression that may not be familiar with your writings. I thought we could begin with you just giving kind of a brief outline of your background, your current involvement. Well, actually, we're uh, primarily institutional and it's been that way from uh largely in the 70s and little by little it's been you know what i would say been um expanding into the general um population i mean we've always dealt with corporations and governments and things of that nature and largely because we were probably the first to to start with currency uh, forecasting. So since the 1974, uh, first recession that was created by, uh, currency, we've been called in practically for every crisis ever since. And, um, it's been, it's been interesting to watch, but I, I think a lot of people don't appreciate that we have primarily either academics, uh, advising but we have primarily lawyers running it. And so there's very little experience or, or, I mean, they should just, you know, hire traders from a, from a trading desk. They would at least understand the economy better than, than what we see with uh, the political class. Martin, we're here to discuss financial repression. And I wonder if you could uh, define it in your words and uh, describe it in regards to what kinds of things that you're seeing right now. Well, I would say the primary issue of that that really drives it is it's it's really just a power struggle. And historically, you always go through these periods between um, where the confidence in the public is with the people or the private sector, and then you have like a 1929 crash and, and Great Depression, and then they turn to government. And it, this oscillates back and forth, and now we're in a phase which we would call is a private sector phase, where people are questioning government, is Social Security even going to last, etc. Uh, but uh, I would say that you know the people sometimes create, give these um, politicians way too much credit. They assume they actually know what they're doing, and they don't. It, it's just one step after the other. And so the repression comes in where it's it's whatever they have to do to maintain power today is what they do. And, you know, nobody looks back at a mirror to say, gee, we're, you know, how have we gone here? And so it's kind of like the NSA in the sense that, well, now we have to just take everything from everybody, and then we'll know what everybody's saying, and we'll be able to pick out who's against us. And it's, they just keep going further and further and further. So this uh, financial repression is, is largely that they are going broke. They have promised themselves all sorts of pensions and things of this nature, but they don't fund it. And I, you know, was trying to donate my time back in the early 90s to help uh, take Social Security and make it a, like a, a national wealth fund to actually invest the money. And honestly, I couldn't, I couldn't, I give up because it, it was, at that time, it was like, they, you know, once I wouldn't vote for it because, well, gee, when we get in charge, we don't change everybody who's there. And, and I said, this is nothing, it has nothing to do with putting your brother-in-law in charge of this stuff. You know, we have to send out money to people who have actually valid track records. And you don't 
swap them back and forth just because of politics change. But this is the way politics runs. You know, it's it's uh, the spoils or so give it to your your family and friends. So as far as the as the amount, the degree of pensions that are unfunded, the entitlement programs that are unfunded, the sense I get is they just don't care. They don't understand. There's another set of agendas going on. I, I would say, honestly, they do not understand. And part of the problem is, is that there is no design. Everything has been very ad hoc. And... I mean, a lot of people, you know, talk about all oh, the Fed, etc. Well, you know, to be fair, what is the Fed? When, when it first began, it made perfect sense. It was correctly designed. And people don't understand. It only lasted for a very brief period of time like that. It, to stimulate the economy, they bought private paper, not government. You know, to, and because so if there was a, a banking crisis, then they would buy corporate paper so the corporations didn't have to lay off people. And they would actually stimulate the economy directly. You also had 12 branches. So each branch was independent and maintained a separate interest rate. When World War I comes, they usurped this power, and Congress said, well, we're going to have to issue debt to pay for the war, so we, you have to buy ours, not theirs. And then they never put the stuff back. Then, you know, Great Depression comes. And then Roosevelt says, oh, well, you know, we have to really control things. So he usurps all the interest rates, all the independence of the Fed, and brings it to Washington. So then there's one interest rate for everybody. Then World War II comes. So what does he do then? He then directs the Federal Reserve. They must support the U.S. government bonds at par. All right, that wasn't lifted until 1951. And you, you go through each crisis, they keep adding something else, but they never return it to where it was. And so 2007 comes, and then we hear, oh, it's too big to fail. So what do they do? They pass legislation now that the Fed can take over any entity, all right, if it thinks it's too big to fail, and that includes McDonald's. It's no longer a central bank. And... You know, people say, oh, well, it's, it's corrupt because it's owned by the banks. Well, initially, all it was was supposed to be something that was run by the banks to protect the banks. They contributed themselves. They didn't buy government bonds. I mean, that model lasted really just very briefly. It was, it was to, to really mimic what J.P. Morgan did in 1907. But we keep altering things, and they never put it back. So... If you look at, at the picture, is there an actual plan? I don't think so. It's worse than that. It's it's not really a conspiracy. It is just an absolute, you know, it's it's the Keystone Cops. Uh, <laughs> it, it's a level of incompetence. So it's it's reactive. It moves from crisis to crisis. It never resets, which kind of leads to the instability and chaos. Is not eventually yeah, it's, what it's, comes it's, out of it. <laughs> Far worse than these conspiracy theories even can possibly imagine. I mean, I have been in the Treasury. I went down there when, you know, Reagan was in, and I, and I, just taking a simple pocket calculator, Volcker raises interest rates to 17%. All right. And, oh, we're going to have to stop inflation. And I said, guys, you are now having to pay this on government bonds. And, just taking a pocket calculator, not being an analyst here, um, or a forecaster, said we're going to be at six trillion dollars by the end of the decade. This was the year nineteen eighty one, and they just looked at me and they said, "Yeah, we'll be paying back with cheaper dollars." You know, and then you 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 talk to them and you say, "Well, you know, why do you borrow? Are you going to pay anything back?" And they just look at you and they say, "Well, of course not. That's a stupid question." So why are we borrowing? Nobody knows. You look at the national debt, you can go get an almanac they sell in, in most you know bookstores and just add up the interest expenditures of the national debt that they have made, you know, since nineteen fifty, and you'll see that seventy percent of the entire national debt is a cumulative interest. So it didn't go to create schools and roads and things of this nature. The whole socialist idea is complete nonsense. 
you know, it's 70% of the entire national debt is interest. And then, so they tell, you know, pension funds, et cetera, most of them, you know, have, you know, they have to be conservative. Well, what's conservative? They buy government debt. And honestly, that creates no jobs. And all it really does is, is perpetuates the entire illusion that, you know, the government's in control. And what we're seeing in Europe right now is that it's not in control. Um, it, it's it's a total disaster. Does the WIS actions here this week of removing the peg uh, an example of that? Yes. I mean, <clears throat> um, the, the Euro Commission came to us in 97. And this is an example of what I mean by ad hoc. Sat down with them, said, okay, fine. The idea was they wanted to create a single currency to compete with the United States. I said, fine, but you're going to have to consolidate the debt, same as Alexander Hamilton did. He took all the debts from the states and made it a federal. And they said, oh, well, you know, we don't think we can get that through um, the vote system over there. So they said, phase one, they just wanted to create the currency first, get started. Then they would take care of the debts. Then the problem is the people that make the decision at that time, they leave. Okay? The new people are there. And I talked to them and said, well, what about, whatever happened to phase two? What are you talking about? What is that? They have no clue. So what you're seeing now is, is a total disaster. Now, each bank over there has reserves. What are reserves? Over here, it's only federal government bonds. Okay, in Europe, well, you have to be politically correct. So what do you do? You have to have bonds of every member country because they don't have a single national debt. So therefore, Greece goes down, or this, the the debt, the debts of those of Southern Europe, their bond values have decreased. So what does EU do? You don't have to mark the market. They do not have to report any loss in the banks whatsoever. As long as somebody at least makes some sort of a payment, it's not a default. That's why Germany just came out to uh, Greece and saying, you know, we'll convert your debt to 100 years. As long as they don't have to call it a default, you know, the banks are okay. As soon as the bank doesn't really have that money on its books, and it's all fiction anyhow, then the whole thing collapses. And that's what you're beginning to see. So the Swiss... Um, I met with them too, and, and I, in 2012, I told them there's no, historically, no peg has ever lasted. The Asian currency crisis was attempted to do a peg. The British pound with the, you know, Soros became famous on, uh, with the Deutsche Mark. That peg was broken. I mean, even take the gold standard, Brenton Woods, all right, we fixed the, the dollar at $35. That failed. You cannot fix anything. It doesn't work, right? At some point in time, the business cycle is going to go positive and negative. You can't perpetually hold something forever. And so the Swiss had to get out. All they were doing, and I explained to them, and this is, you know, their eyes kind of opened up, but uh, effectively, you're giving me a guaranteed trade. I can buy Swiss and give you all the euros. And you're guaranteeing to buy them from me. If I'm wrong, I just swap it back. It didn't cost me anything because you're pegging it. If I'm right, I make 30% in a day. It's like going to, to a casino playing, you know, roulette, okay? You put everything on red. You lose. No, give me my money back. I'll go again. <laughs> it's brain dead. But they try it. Largely, it's academics or whatever that, that concoct these things, and they just do not last. Where does this lead? What do you see unfolding in the next year to year and a half? We are in a debt bubble. I mean, people, you know, they'll, they'll see, oh, the stock market's overvalued or this, that, and the other. We are not facing a stock market crash. We're facing a bond crash. And that is far worse than the stock market. You can take the stock market down to 10 cents on the dollar. That does not create a great depression. And if you want to verify that, all the books written on the Great Depression were basically propaganda. 
and that includes Galbraith's uh, The Great Crash. You want to read something, go read chapter on 1931, Herbert Hoover's memoirs. All right, it's free online. He has all the documentation in there. What people do not realize is that was a sovereign debt crisis. The stock market from 29 to 30 fell about 60%, normal correction. Then comes 1931. What happens then? Basically, all of Europe defaults. Britain went into a moratorium, eventually came back. But they all default on their national debts. All right, South America defaulted for about the fourth time. China defaulted. I mean, you can go on eBay and buy these bonds. They're for sale. People sell them all. I mean, they look very nice. You can frame them up. Um, you wiped out capital formation. And that's what a bond crash does. You know, because all your pension funds are involved. Everybody, you know, <clears throat> the saying that, you know, that Marilyn Monroe had for the movie, you know, German like blondes, the real saying was, was <clears throat> Mellon. And basically what he said was right after the crash in 29 in October, he boasted, because the stocks went down, but the bonds initially went up in the flight to quality. He said, gentlemen, buy bonds, not blondes. Um, and, he was bragging that the stock, that, you know, he was conservative and the bond market rallied. Well, then the bond market crashed. So, Great Depression, everybody lost. That's what we're facing. We're facing a bond bubble here. I mean, interest rates are going negative. What are you going to do? Are you going to give the government 10% to hold your money now? I mean, at some point, this is just, got, it, this ends. You know, when people begin to realize that the euro is crashing here, they're not going to buy the bonds. You look at the interest rates within um, within the euro. You have German interest rates down at basically 40 basis points on 10 years, and, and where Greece is at 11%. So the capital within Europe has been buying Germany and selling everything else. Why? Because they expect the euro to crash, and they think they'll get Deutsche Marks. So we're in a period where, where capital is, on a global scale, doesn't know where to go. And the culprit is government. It's not, you know, stock market being overvalued or anything else. So we're in a period where there will be more confidence to go buy bonds from General Motors than it would be from, you know, from uh, any government. Because there's a substantial difference between private and public debt. When a corporation goes bust, okay, fine, there's bankruptcy, you get something back, maybe it's 10 cents on the dollar. When a government goes bust, you can't go down to the National Gallery and start lifting out Picassos. You get zero. It's unsecured. And that's the difference between private versus public. You're just buying the full faith and credit, as they say, of the government. You have nothing to hang a hat on. So a government default, as it was in 1931, is very serious stuff. And this is what we're facing. This is what you're seeing with the euro. This is why the Swiss had to back out. Why? Because next week it's expected the ECB is going to start buying government debt to support the countries that are failing. And I'm advising our clients Sell them everything you possibly can. And you see that actually happening next week from the ECB? Most likely, yeah. Because I don't, again, you have to understand what's going on. They have, there's a self-interest. It's Adam Smith's invisible hand. All right. Is Brussels going to do anything or Washington going to do anything against themselves? No. We are always the problem. It's the private sector. So, the euro is crashing. Rather than them admitting that the, the design is wrong, if the euro goes, why do we why do we need you know 150,000 you know bureaucrats in in Brussels? The whole idea of a central government failed. All right, so it's their personal jobs on on the line, and that's why they're defending the euro, and they'll defend it to the last drop of blood of the private sector. These people do not care about us. It is always about them. 
And just look in the United States where they passed this crazy law factor. And uh, people don't realize, but only the United States and Japan are taxed on worldwide income. So they just carte blanche and say, okay, fine, every, every institution around the world, their assets will be confiscated unless they report what Americans are doing overseas. Well, not every American um, lives here. Okay, I have, for example, a friend in, in Switzerland who is Swiss. He married an American girl. She's lived there for 20-some years, and her 14-year-old son went down to open up a bank, and the bank refused to allow him to open up an account. Why? Because he's an American. And they would have to report to the U.S., and if they don't, their assets can be confiscated. So anybody with any American heritage whatsoever has been thrown out of banks around the world. And it's it's really destroying the world economy. All because why? They need money. Yeah, we've done a number of shows on, on FATCA, and it's just astounding as we listen to people all around the world, expat problems that they're going through on a daily basis just trying to exist. Oh, it's it's unbelievable. The IRS has been sending letters out to Canadians who had one parent that was American. They've lived in Canada their whole life. Oh, you owe us taxes. For what? Taxes are supposed to be you're paying for your fair share of services. What if you don't use any services you shouldn't be paying? That's where the rest of the world works. Only the United States goes the other way. Knowing these kinds of things, what should investors be doing today? Well, if you understand what's actually happening, I would not, you know, I would basically get rid of any type of government bond, uh, be it federal, state, or local. And I would start looking, understand what's coming, you have municipalities, even in Germany, more than 50% of the municipal governments are bankrupt. They're talking about imposing a 10% tax to try and bail out the municipals. We have the same problem here. Um, just look at it from a practical standpoint. A small town that had, let's say, you know, 10 policemen. Well, five retire. So what happens? They've never funded this stuff. They've always assumed there's enough schmucks out there to always tax. So now those five are retired. They have to pay them their salary. And what do they do? They have to now hire five more people. So taxes are going up exponentially. Our living standard is declining largely because of taxes. This is the deflationary aspect that People keep thinking that, you know, oh, well, they're going to print more money and therefore be inflationary. No, it's actually deflationary at this stage because the taxes are, are rising exponentially at every level. Uh, and we just, you know, jumped up. Many people in the United States now, small businesses, etc., are going to be well over 40% in taxes this year. If investors should stay away from government debt instruments, what should they be looking at? What should they be moving towards for protection? Probably some of the, you know, the blue chip type stocks, things of this nature. Um, I would look at even at, at corporate bonds. I mean, that's where the big money is going to go. The, uh, the smaller, you know, for investors, you know, they can have some like gold coins, things of this nature. I would use coins and not bullion. And even that's getting dicey because Minnesota just passed a law regulating anybody that sells precious metals and their definition was out, um, unbelievable. Any coin containing more than 1%, 1% of precious metals <laughs> must be identified to the state. So, you know, I'm not really sure what's going on here if we're just going to be, you know, all the way to a Mad Max type thing or, you know, at, at what point is this going to break? Um, but they're all going after taxes every which way. Uh, Philadelphia and or Pennsylvania and New Jersey cut a tax deal. You go buy a car and you live in one state and you buy a, they share the tax. Who's ever highest tax rate you have to pay, and the other one gets the, the difference. So they're all starting cross-border, um, you know, sharing information internationally. They're doing this. It's just really, they're all hunting money everywhere. 
So I don't know. It's going to reach a point where it just really is quite serious. But And then we probably have the crash and the burn, and hopefully maybe at that point we, we get to reform and we throw some of these crazy people out. But um, We can only hope. Historically, it does. How much pain we got to have is, is something else. Yeah, and let's hope that the when that happens, that the right people surface to take us in the right direction. But history says that's not always what happens. No, 1933 was an interesting year. You had Roosevelt here, yes. You had Hitler come to power in Germany, and you had Mao. Interesting year. Precisely. As we have to wrap here, Martin, and how quickly the time goes, any key messages you would like to leave for our um, investors? Well, I think it's a time that, you know, the better educated you are and least, you know, do not, I would stay away from the talking heads on TV and, and more or less the, the problem with mainstream media is the same thing with the analysis that comes out of the main institutions. It has to be politically correct. Not one single institution uh, has put out a cell signal on the euro before. Why? Because if they did, the ECB would have called them. So they have to put out politically correct analysis. You have to see the same thing from the mainstream media. This is why Snowden went to The Guardian in London. If he showed up at any newspaper in the United States, they would offer him a cup of coffee and try to keep him there while the NSA was on their way over. This is the way, you know, it really is. We do not live in such a free society, and it's all very quietly done behind the scenes, but this is the way it is. So just, you know, I think use a rational head be uh, objective in what you're doing and, and looking at it and, and test whatever it is you hear. Could you tell our listeners how they could follow your writing and your blog? Uh, it's at armstrongeconomics.com. And we, you know, we don't charge. We, we try to keep as much open for the public to use as possible there. So um, we're trying to do our part. And you certainly are, Martin. Thank you very much for the time today. Great discussion. I appreciate your honesty and your frankness, and I'm sure a lot of our listeners will get an awful lot out of it from today. So thank you very much, and we'll talk to you again. Okay. Thank you for inviting me. This has been Gordon T. Long, editor and publisher of GordonTLong.com. New recordings are posted regularly and can be found at GordonTLong.com. New show notifications are available through RSS feed, iTunes, and other social networking venues at GordonTLong.com.